You are comfortably zoned with the Zigzag Man in Alameda, California, pushing on the doors of life marked pull and fighting the unholy trinity as we go. Big business, organized religion, and government. We are comfortably zoned in San Francisco, California. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm the Zigzag Man, Ralph Tycho, and we have special guest today. One of them is a old friend of mine from the 80s who started in comedy when I did at, uh, I think we started at the Rose and Thistle, if I'm not mistaken. And Emerson Street Bar and Grill. Oh, we'll talk about Emerson's for, for a while. Were you with me when um, when I produced that show in Berkeley and we all stood out in the... Um, in the uh, rain, as it were, with audience and performers, and the show fell through that night. Oh, I think I remember that. <laughs> yeah, those were many, many years ago, and we've been doing comedy over the years. Um, our guest is the very famous Rebecca Ward Kennedy. Welcome to Comfortably Zoned. Thanks. It's good to be here. Good to see you after all this time. Wow. It's been a long time. Well, I raised a child and a stepchild. Uh, um, Rebecca raised three children. And joining us in the studio is commentator Scott Gilpin, who raised two children of his very own. So we've got a lot to talk about. How you doing, Scott? Doing great. Thanks, Zig. All right. We've got a good show today, and I'm very happy that you guys are here. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is because Rebecca and I came up um, in the 80s. What was your first on-stage experience like? Oh, wow. It was... I it was great because I'd gone to see Emerson's, um, the open mic, because I'd just broken up with a boyfriend and I was trying to look for something fun to do and Emerson's was nearby. I saw the f a show and I thought, you know, the material I've been writing is at least as bad as this. So I went back the next week and I performed and the host that night was Alex Reed. Oh, wow. And then he went on to win an Emmy for writing for Malcolm in the Middle. And then started meeting more friends there that just started getting famous. And it's like, hey, I knew them way back then. Like um, Carlos Alas Rocky. Now, you know, now. Carlos did the voice. Carlos Alas Rocky. He did the voice of the the little uh, dog on Taco Bell for a lot of years. Incredibly talented guy. Very versatile and very. Personable. He he's a human being. So nice to have. Who are some of the other? Do you remember Lance Solo at the oh, Holy? Yes. City? Oh yeah, Lance Solo and Kevin Kataoka. I still see Kevin when he comes to town. Go oh wow! Well, yeah. Go say hi to him. Uh, let's see. Don McMillan comes to town sometimes. Uh, usually roosters. I go down and say hi to him. Um, oh wow! Who else? Um, I know Rob Schneider performed a few times at Emerson's, but he wasn't really much of a, a fixture there. He was a local boy, but would show up once in a while yeah. before you know before he got big. Let's get back to you a little bit. You're not originally from uh, San Francisco, uh, originally from Missouri, with links uh, all over. Um, yeah, I am. Um, was born in Kentucky, and then we moved around a lot, a lot, and then I ended up going to... Were your parents in the witness protection program or in the military, or both? No, my dad just, he, he was a construction worker, and he always thought he could move someplace new and make a better life for his family, and we would get there, and it would be just as bad, and he'd move us somewhere else, and... <laughs> well, how did, um... How did you become so articulate and um, well-spoken? Because you're talking about states that you lived in that were um, not conducive to that. I know when I when I go home for um, family reunions, <laughs> I I revert back to um, to a lot of my accent I had back then. Um, like, um, oh, y'all better get over there and get that thing done, or else we're gonna get in a lot of trouble. And well, yeah. But what what Americanized you? 
I think just moving around so much and trying on purpose to get rid of the accent and try to um, try to sound like a grown-up. <laughs> not, not some. I come from a long line of hillbillies. Um, <laughs> right. So I'm trying to. I've been trying to get rid of that. Um, that because when you go looking for jobs, um, you know, actual paid jobs instead of being a mommy. Um, they expect you to have a certain demeanor and a certain way of speaking, especially when I was looking for a receptionist well, jobs. It also helps when you're raising your kids. If your mm -hmm. kids can listen to you speaking properly, that uh, they're not apt to speak in a hillbilly manner. Yeah. Let's not uh, downgrade hillbillies at all. Oh, no. uh, what did you? What's the number one thing you got from your upbringing that may be considered hillbillyish? And I put that in quotes. Uh, to we northerners or easterners or whatever? What'd you get? Because you're a tremendous person. Oh, thanks. I think mostly that I hate wearing shoes. Um, <laughs> okay. Is there? Uh, <laughs> yeah, they're just, uh, they feel very constrictive, and you know, I used to run across gravel barefoot, and you know, um, I just I. I I'm just a little bit claustrophobic and shoes, you know, as soon as I get home, that's, the shoes come off right away. Okay. So that's a hillbilly thing, mm -hmm. you'd say. Um, uh, what was school like in the most hillbillyish of circumstances? Was it like a one, one grade, you know, one school, 12 grades? Um, well, one school I went to, the entire town was only 600 people. I graduated, um... Um, 12th out of the 79 kids in my high school. This was 10 miles by 10 miles. There were only 79 12th graders. In the, imagine 79 12th graders in all of San Francisco. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That was. It wasn't. It wasn't a one-room school, but it was a small school. <laughs> um. How is it different for your children being raised in San Francisco and? Uh, what do you draw upon from your education mm -hmm. to make sure that they're getting the best of all worlds? I think kids in San Francisco are spoiled uh, for one reason. You know, you could go to a museum any day you want to. You can, you can, you don't have to drive ten miles to get to a library. You, um, you know, I keep seeing things that I think. If I was a kid, I would love to do that, you know, take art classes that you can almost pretty much do for free. In Sanford, there's so many park and rec stuff. And, you know, when I was growing up, if, you, if we had a chance to go to the circus, that was a big deal. And I, I think there, it's great that kids have a lot of opportunities. Especially my oldest boy, he's a film major at San Francisco State. Well, my kid is into film too, and your child is mm -hmm. 20, and mine is 21. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to junior college at uh, in Alameda, on and off, mm -hmm. and working <laughs> and uh, what have you. But film is his passion. So, uh, what do you suppose motiv was his motivation to get into film? Um, you know, he. <clears throat> I don't know if he really had a motivation, but. He's always been kind of a, a very thoughtful, as in thinking versus athletic and whatever. And mm -hmm. um, he started by making stop motion films, you know, one frame at a time. And then he turned to claymation. And um, now he, he edited a movie called Esther and Me. It's a documentary about um, a lady named Esther Weintraub, um, Lisa Gedaldig. Um, I know her well yeah. from uh, the Kosher Comedy yeah. Club circuit. Yeah, definitely. She uh, she filmed a lady named Esther Weintraub in uh, the Jewish Home for the Aged and put, held on to the, the raw footage for a long time. And she was like, oh, I don't know how to edit this. And my son Adam was like, I'm an editor. Um, and now it's being, it's winning awards in Jewish film festivals all around the world. Wow. Yeah. That is very, very terrific. He's, just, he's, he's incredibly talented. They showed it at the Victoria. They showed it at the Roxy. Um, you know, they're selling the DVDs online. Um, my, we even have to buy the DVDs ourselves. <laughs> so, you know, Comfortably Zoned is, is based on the premise of self, selfless 
self promotion mm -hmm. for those of us around us uh -huh. and you become uh, so quickly part of uh, the comfortably zone family oh, you're nice. so you give uh, our listeners out there all the info as to what's going on right now with the, with your son how to get to him what is um, right now well uh, let's see you can find him uh, if you go to um, estherandme.com, you can find a link to how to get to Adam. And he's got other videos he's working on. He's he's uh, actually editing a new film called um, Sin Padre um, about a Mexican family without a father um, and how they deal with that. And so he's working on that. Um, he, if you go to Adam Kennedy Multimedia. He's, he takes um, uh, kids' school portraits, and he's working as a photographer at J.C. Penney. So, and, and I just saw a picture of him um, on your Facebook. Uh -huh. He looks so much like his dad, who started out doing comedy with us way back then. And we both met uh, very significant people, oh, yeah. our, our sp <laughs> spouses, as it were. Uh -huh. um, Spousal equivalents. Yes. Um, and uh, they were responsible for our bringing kids into the world. And I think... Um, it, to get back to the original premise of our interview, you stopped your career, basically, mm -hmm. as did I. I was the house dad for Philip's first five years, and um, you stopped your career to ha have children and uh, experience the satisfaction of that. What in comedy, when you were doing comedy before stopping, now that you've gotten back to it, and that's what uh, I admire, someone who's going to do it no matter what for the rest of their lives and keep their passion going that's why you're here but before you stopped and when it, when you stopped the first time and you went into parenthood what did you take from your stage experience into your parental experience um dealing with heckling um <laughs> kids can heckle you a lot mom what is this uh, what are you making for dinner and why does it smell like that right. so you tell them do i slap the ha the ham out of your your sandwich when you're making sandwiches or <laughs> you come back to that heckler right uh how about can i buy you a drink how about a glass of vinegar for that douchebag over there right <laughs> well, that's how i used to handle hecklers when i was on stage um or under stage. Get back to get back to what else you learned from being on stage. What did you take with you? Um, a sense of patience, for one thing. Um, you may not be a star today. You, uh, the kid may not be all raised by the end of the day, but you one step at a time. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and, and um, it's it, it's like there's two parts of my life. I. Um, being with my kids is like whenever whenever somebody writes occupation I write mommy because that's like that's my focus and I've been able to sort of deal with a yeah you know, have a sense of humor through all these these uh, adventures that kids will bring into your life um, you know my my youngest boy he's kind of OCD like if he he has to be the one to push the elevator button and if somebody else does, he has to let everybody else get on the elevator, and then he'll push the button to bring the elevator that for himself to get on. And if I didn't have a sense of humor, I would be like, you know, grabbing him by the hair and dragging him in. Right. <laughs> just, just thinking, okay, that's him. You know, that's just the way he is. I, I you, can. Live you let with him it. be. Yeah. You let yeah. him be the and person that, that he is. That's who he is. Okay. Were your parents like that with you? Not that you were with the elevator, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> well, you know, my parents, they, they, they never, my dad never spanked us, but he would um, kind of make us feel kind of bad about ourselves and not, not very smart. So I kind of felt like I had to overcome, you know, his perception. Um, and he was very much an entertainer, too. He was in the, in the theater. Um, uh, he, so that's where you got it. Yeah, I think so. He he would love to perform for kids, and he would do these tricks like, like he he could, even when he was in his seventies, he could grab a lamppost and lift his legs up so they were parallel to the sidewalk. 
incredibly strong and this tells you what kind of guy my dad is. Tornadoes came through Branson, Missouri a couple of weeks ago, went through the cemetery where my dad is buried, pulled up every tree in the cemetery, did not touch my dad's um, uh, tombstone. tombstone or burial spot or anything. I thought even after he's passed away, tornadoes do not even mess with my dad. You don't yeah. mess with a World War II vet. No, no abs <laughs> absolutely not. And uh, that was the said to be the last war worth fighting. Mm. What do you give your kids in the way of pacifism pa um, and anti-war stuff, if anything? Um, I kind of let them have their own way of dealing with it. I never tell them, you know, okay, this is how you have to think. This is how you have to be. Um, you know, my kid, my kids go out and they they participate in like you know the school fundraising um, protests and everything. Even you know skipping school to go march. And um, I think my parents would have thrown a fit if I had done something like that. If I'd skipped school to go make a statement about something. Um, yeah. Why, why do you suppose that was? That my parents behaved yeah. that way. Yeah. I, I think they just had a very strict in, in environment. My. Uh, um, my dad was very overly protective, and so he kept, you know, a strong, um, uh, making us behave kind of thing, you know. Um, kept a tight grip. Tight grip, yep. Um, I. How many siblings did you have, Rebecca? I got four younger sisters, okay. and he, he loosened up by the time my youngest one, youngest sister came along, because she's 21 years younger than me. Right. So he, I think he was just too tired. <laughs> right. he, he was 58 when she was born, so he's like. <laughs> oh, wow. That's almost <laughs> ancient. His parents were grandparents. <laughs> by then, they're just too tired. <laughs> did you have a grandparent experience? Um, not. Not a very positive one. The only grandparent, well, my dad's uh, parents died when he was really young, so he was raised in an orphanage during the Depression. So he, uh, I never knew those grandparents. Um, on my mom's side, my grandpa died when I was like three, so I don't even remember him. Uh, my grandma, she, um, she wasn't really a grandmotherly, friendly grandma type. It, it, she was like the person we went and sat on her couch while my mom and her talked together and I can you know I can kind of imagine her not um, getting involved in all of her grandkids lives because uh, my mom had 17 brothers and sisters and we're not wow. even Catholic and we're not Mormon or Catholic that's just what you do in Missouri <laughs> <laughs> a lot of cold winter nights <laughs> My mom was the 16th out of the 18 kids. Wow. And My then, dad was the ninth out of um, nine, and uh, I thought that was, you know, hearing yeah. about that, I thought that was a lot of kids to be having. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, it is now. I mean, I, I would have liked to have more kids. I just, I really enjoy being a mommy. Um, right. Um, I've enjoyed being a stay-at-home mom all this time and doing all the volunteering, um, I've, uh, but yet you have this quest to be on stage. Yep. Yeah. But just because my kids are getting older, because my youngest is 11. Right. Um, you know, the older boys can watch him. Have they heard you at all? Yeah, they have. My my oldest boy filmed me the last time I was at uh, the Bazaar Cafe. Uh, wow. That's very cool. Yeah. He helps me get um, videos up on YouTube. Good, mm -hmm. good. So he's part of it. Yeah, and I yeah. Tr I trust him to <laughs> to do. Tell you, put the ones up that are funny. Yeah. And my kids have um, heard me at Camp Mather. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's a family camp outside of Yosemite. I've heard of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to sort of self-edit when I do the talent show because the preschoolers are sitting in front so I don't do much I don't go remember right. last time you got laid and like, it's like remember last time you had a juice box um, yes, uh, we will <laughs> we'll save that for another audience <laughs> yeah. That, um, yeah you have to that's part that's of it I, I can remember not being a very good panderer uh, I remember going to a show and it turns out the producer weighed about 300 pounds and I only had about three five jokes and one of them was about the dyslexic bulimic who got sick before eating <laughs> and she just looked at me the producer just looked at me from the stage it was a group of 
folk and uh, didn't have me back because uh -huh. uh, I didn't choose what to say in front of the audience. But that's okay. I've uh, been that way in the past. Um, yeah, I really only get nervous if I'm going to a club I've never been before because I don't know what the audience is going to expect. You, you know, I could be walking into a biker bar and I'm going to have different material than if I'm doing the PTA fundraiser. Right. Um, so if if I've been somewhere before, I get a feeling for what material is going to work there, or if I watched the other comics before me. Great. Um, hey, two things. First of all, let's get back to your first stage experience. Uh -huh. Tell me uh, from start to start to finish. Oh, we. Oui. Um, I went and signed up, and very very nervous because I'd never. Just like an open mic. Yep. It was the open mic at Emerson's, and. After I got a stage, I, th I, I, you know, I had a couple of okay jokes. Um, of course, when you're starting out, you you just you haven't learned what works for you yet. But the thing I noticed when I got off stage, the comedians were so nice about saying, oh, you know, there's this place in Redwood City, and there's Captain Cooks in Cupertino, and there's the 94th Aero Squadron, and I was even getting rides to these places because I didn't have a car at the time, and I was just stunned by how supportive the San Francisco and the, the whole Bay Area comedy scene is. You know, people, um, I would get together with one of my friends, uh, Pete Kirby, and we wrote material together, and he's moved up to Oregon. Um, and will not return my Facebook. <laughs> so, na na na, that was a bad breakup. Um, <laughs> well, that happens. Yeah, um, but but while we were friends, we were really good friends. Um, and I just found that I've I've developed a lot of really good friendships that I still keep in contact with, even even after all these years. Nice, yeah. nice. So, so the first time on stage, I I only had a bicycle so that's why I went to Emerson's because I was living in East Palo Alto on the west side of the highway and just rode my bike up uh, University to get to Emerson Street. Ah, I just had a flash of, of somebody uh, Big Dave Cohen do you remember? Yes. Him? Oh yeah I remember him. Yeah he uh, was a good guy I hope he's okay I don't see him on Facebook or anything. Um, I think he didn't Big Dave Cohen pass away? Well that wouldn't be okay yeah. <laughs> uh, under the de strict definitional but then again under pay I didn't know that uh, I just heard it as a rumor, but I haven't I haven't heard for sure. I haven't. You know. uh, I'm very sorry. He was an entertaining, mm -hmm. good-hearted guy, and uh, mm -hmm. that scares me. Uh, another friend from those days, Fred Reese, has been recovering from yeah. an illness of late. And on him, checking his Facebook. Um, I hope I hope he's gonna he's gonna beat this like he did um, last time a bunch I, of years ago. Um, he is one of the toughest guys yeah. around. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of tough guys who beat shit all the time, Scott Gilpin, um, how you doing, big guy? <laughs> I'm doing fine. Thanks for asking. And beating everything in sight. Um, Scott's our political commentator. He doesn't like that word. <laughs> What's going on? We'll take a little break from talking to you for a second because we get a full studio. Um, <laughs> what do you make of the possibilities, Scott, of... Um, of Santorum running with uh, uh, with Romney, who seems to, at this late date, this is being recorded um, first week in April. Uh, what do you suppose is that just out of the or out of the realm of possibility, or can we draw upon the experiences of Hillary Clinton and President Obama when they were going through uh, the process of killing each other, um, and then they came together? Is that a possibility? Do you see it that way? I, you know what? After this election, and I've seen many, I, anything is possible. It just seems like it's been a clown show on both sides from beginning to end. I remember uh, when Hillary was getting down and dirty against Obama and uh, then she ends up in his cabinet and now we hear Santorum or you're telling me that Santorum is considering Well he's uh, not considering I, it but the, the, um, pundits have brought up the possibility that um, either he's staying in too long to be the spoiler or he'll get out at just the right time and give his support, and uh, that it isn't uh, beyond the realm of possibility to unite the 
the party, the GOP, Grand Old Party, to unite them in their viciousness or their uh, toxic mentality, if you want to take it that way, and I do. But um, any chance, would you say, is that absolutely out of the realm of possibility? I, I couldn't say that's true. I'd say that I'd say that it's shaping up again to be more of a clique fight than a fight about principles regardless of how they try to come off and which voters uh, sector they want to appeal to but when it when it comes time they'll drop what they said shake hands put on their happy face and it's a clique fight more than it is a fight about principles even though they sound very different to a lot of people underneath it all they don't really have that much to dispute that's of significance to the guy on the street. I think we talked about last um, last time the, the differences in our country since Obama has been president. You really couldn't tell them from the times that uh, that Bush was president. It's just a different package to it. I know, and and to hear Santorum say that Romney is just Obama light. And if Obama gets elected again, the country is headed over an abyss, which may be true. Uh, but he's going to yet, from what you're telling me, consider being on a team with Obama light. Uh, then I just have to ask myself, what's the point of going down and pulling a lever for any of these guys? And uh, would you consider not doing that because you're a voter? Well, if it worse came to worse, what would you... I'm not asking you who you're going to vote for, but... Not voting to you seems like, um, given the American way and your your ideals, um, I don't think you can not vote. Well, we we have to part company because I have never voted for a Democrat or a Republican. Or, to put it another way, I've never voted for a Demo-Publican or a Republicrat. I vote for certain referendum, bond measures to keep the library afloat, things where I think a yes or no, up or down vote might make some drop in the bucket difference but as between Tweedledum or Tweedledee uh, these parties are flip sides of the same coin the way I see it and this kind of um, posturing that you saw where one the the Democrats genuflect in one direction and the Republicans genuflect in another direction and then they both race for the middle um, is meaningless it does uh, I don't think it does us any good at all I think we're the laughing stock of the world when it comes to that sort of thing. Uh, strong opinion to follow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll vote at home with my feet up on the coffee table. All right. And my bumper sticker is uh, going to say, don't blame me, I didn't vote for him. And I can keep that bumper sticker from one election cycle to the next. <laughs> but like I said, when it comes to certain referendums, uh, like California's famous for putting voters' initiatives on the ballot. Certain of those I take very seriously, and I pull a lever for it, you know, because I think it matters mm -hmm. somewhat. You right. really have a little bit of a say. Um, here's a question. In Alameda, where I live, I've been bombarded lately. You come out of any supermarket, you have folks that are vying for your signature, trying to get you registered, so that you can vote for this, that, or the other thing. And my point is, they're being paid to, in, quote, inform you of whatever it is. They're being paid by the number of signatures they get to inform one of the issue that you're signing. Now, two things. First of all, if the, it, my thing is, if the issue is worth signing, there would be a grassroots efforts of folks that are not being paid out there trying to influence you. Mm -hmm. Is there something inherently wrong with a system that trains puppets to, uh, to recite an ideology just so that they can get people to sign it and the more organized they are that's what determines what goes goes in can you talk about that a little is it, is it just not are you just buying votes in that case in, in that and many other cases but listen i don't have a particular problem with somebody who's paid to go out and collect signatures when there's full disclosure that that's what his role is because a lot of the grassroots support for different initiatives uh, comes from people who have day jobs you know cool but there is no disclosure that's not even brought up 
and they're not objective when they explain the issue they're not objective about the other side of the issue and there's always two sides to the issue i agree but i don't expect them to be anything but partisan because they're paid by one side to pump that cause so that paying them makes them partisan and it isn't they're being paid to spew their their beliefs which makes them partisan and so you're buying their partisanship. I don't think that's any different from the people who run for office. They're being paid by lobbyists to take the positions they take. I don't see a difference there. So if you're going to be upset because the fellow outside the supermarket is getting paid to collect signatures, you might as well be upset that the candidate who calls you with a robocall to vote a certain way is getting paid by lobbyists f for what he does. They're spokespeople. Oh. That's what they're hired spokespeople like talking heads on the five o'clock news hour. So how do we evoke change? For Christ's sake, I'm 65 years old. I want some change. I want some peace in the world. What would you suggest as a little uh, primer for us all to think about change? In terms of method? In terms of election, uh, the, the election process that we have, be it the two-party system or just the election, uh, election system where votes are bought by not just lobbyists, the advertisers. Money is collected um, by corporations and they go into advertising and the person that has the best advertising generally wins the election. How could that stop? What, what can we do as a country? Uh, what reform, election reform, what would you suggest? Number one thing in election reform. I, I'm, I'm not at all interested in reforming the parliamentary electoral system. I don't have any faith in it. I don't participate in it. I think it's all a giant scam. I do think if you wanted to try to change the methodology of determining who gets elected to represent you, you might drop the territorial uh, system of representation where you elect people by city, by county, by state. Because just because someone lives in my voter's district, he lives on the top of the hill in a multi-million dollar house and never, his feet don't touch the same ground I walk on. Uh, I live in the Oakland Flats. I've got nothing much in common with the person from Piedmont or Kensington uh, or St. John's Woods in San Francisco who runs for office. They might live near me, but they're not me. They don't live like me. They don't think like me. They don't have my interests and they don't have my interests at heart. I would elect people in the workplace. Start with that as the bottom rung of the pyramid. Because if I'm a, uh, an industrial uh, assembly line worker or I'm a secretary or uh, whatever I happen to be, I'm in the medical field, if I elect people to represent me at the bottom level of representation, my immediate direct representative, I know that they live like me, they pay the bills I pay, they have issues like I have to contend with, and they're more likely to think like me. And not only that, I know where they work. And if I don't like what they're doing, I, I have better access. I don't have to pay a lobbyist to go speak to them. Very good point. Scott, it's tremendous being you, buddy. I learn from you on a daily basis. And um, thank you for being here. Thank you both for being here, yeah. but we're not done. We're going to talk about an upcoming comedy comp competition that you're participating in Rebecca Ward Kennedy and uh, tell me what that's about where it's at how you've progressed yeah it's a Bunjo's comedy club um, way out in uh, Danville uh, or Dublin sorry du I keep getting mixed up it's out in Dublin and uh, they started the preliminaries um, I came in second out of 12 so I get to move on to the next round and um, that's coming up uh, April 27th is the next round. Um, I just, I hope I do as well as I did. I'm, I, ho I hope it wasn't just a fluke <laughs> that, right? that I had a good set this past time. Uh, why would it be a fluke? Oh, I don't know. Sometimes yeah. you, you just, you click just right with an audience and then another time you can do the very same material and you hear crickets. Right, uh, and then the crickets stop chirping, and <laughs> uh, that is why. Uh, not just because I did it, I admire every comedian, every musician, every poet who has ever gotten up on stage and put it out there 
and asked for a response. Mm -hmm. You don't always get the response you want. Yep. I, and you have to be prepared for that. And you have to know that you love the material or you wouldn't be doing it. Yep. You have to be married to the material in a way that um, you believe in it and you stick with it. Mm -hmm. And um, I am just so proud of you that after that, after the best career you'll ever have, mm -hmm. it, by my standpoint, I was the house dad. You, mm -hmm. um, I, I, we cannot find anything as meaningful as that from moment to moment. Um, what we call in the in the tribe, the Jewish tribe, it's called nachas that you get from your kid. Mm -hmm. Pleasures. It's not a literal translation, but what you get from your kid, you can't explain. Mm -hmm. And uh, that we share that. We got that from our kids. Uh, I'd like to talk real quickly about our spouses a little bit uh -huh. who brought, brought the ki kids in. I know about mine. We'll talk about Diane in a second. But um, how about Mr. Kennedy? Yeah, we met. Um, I like to say we, our first date was 58 hours and uh, 23 years. And <laughs> after all this... Um, about 17 months ago, he filed for a divorce, and he moved out this past Saturday. And because he's very lenient with the kids, the middle boy moved out with him. The middle boy who has been experimenting with things that he's a little too young for and has missed a lot of school and his dad's like la 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 well yeah you know kids are like that so of course he wants to move out and be with his dad um we we had easter sunday together we had you know i made made easter lunch and you know it <laughs> mostly get along fine but um yeah so he's uh he is doing okay and he started out doing comedy around the time we did, am I yeah. correct? Yeah, um, I think the first time I met him was at a comedy club, and it was like his third time on stage or something, and it was like my 500th, and um, he asked me out, and I was like, okay. <laughs> nice, <laughs> and then, nice. Um, and then we just, you know, got together and had kids. and. Hey, any, any memorances of uh, John Cantu that you'd like to share? Just off the top of my head, one of the most interesting human beings yeah. that I've ever met in my life, John Cantu. Yeah, just uh, actually, John Cantu was running a place called The Mart, and that is where I met my husband. And I'm sure that's where I met you guys, because The, the Mart was a place, um, he was doing a comedy, he had done The Zoo for a long time, he did Rose and Thistle for a long time, he turned over Rose and Thistle to a fellow by the name of Jim Funnigan, I think it's... The, yeah, I I, he went to L.A., and I, I was wondering what happened to him, if you knew, but it doesn't yeah. sound like you do, you're shaking your head, I have no idea. Yeah, um... Yeah, I still, I, um, uh, there's only a few comedians that are still up here that I keep right. around to, uh, Tree. Oh, um, Tree Michael is a yeah. great guy. I was on the road a lot with Michael, yeah. and we'd walk around malls intimidating. Mm -hmm. you, he'd, he'd be intimidating. I'm this little Jewish guy, and Michael, and back in those days, he looked like a biker mm -hmm. with his, his shaved his head. Yeah, yeah. But he was the most gentle, wonderful yeah. guy, and he's still to, around. I used to babysit his cats when he would go out of town, and, and he's doing plays now down in San Jose. He's still with Kristen. Oh, and, good. Um, good. Kristen's daughter had a baby. So, um, Holy Toledo, yeah, so, I'm an old geese, so and my, so are we all. <laughs> um, uh, I, last time I saw him, he was um, playing Cardinal Richelieu in um, The Three Musketeers. Oh. And so he's doing a lot of um, uh, San Jose theater. A theater, work. yeah. I, I think he gave up the stand-up. I haven't heard of him doing any stand okay. up at all for a long time that's very sad because some of the most talented funny mm. uh unabashed humans aren't the ones that um keep going and that's that's sad on that point but everybody finds a venue i've been trying to do radio a little bit mm -hmm. and um everybody's different everybody works differently how about Stu benjamin stewart any memories of ben oh i remember we gave him a ride once um, i did in the to, car to and san jose uh, to Santa Cruz a gig. Uh, Benjamin was severely disabled. Mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. best way to put it. And he lived back in the day before the Disability Act mm -hmm. took effect. And this was the 80s. It took till the 90, yeah. 80s and 90s. Yeah. Of late. I don't think he'd, I think 
he died at age 27. Yeah, he, was he, he was young. He suffered from a rare bone disease, and he was um, in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And he was a Lenny Bruce type comedian. Mm -hmm. He was funnier than heck. He was just uh, and. Uh, there was no one like Benjamin Stewart in the San Francisco comedy scene, and sadly he didn't really make it big, oh, and he died died been. to her. He should have been uh, on Carson every week. Yeah, he, um, he was very much known among the locals, and my my biggest memory is that when we gave him a ride back to his home one time, um, my husband John could not figure out how to get the battery into his wheelchair, oh, wow. and John was just getting. John never gets really frustrated, but he was like, Argh! and um, and Ben was was um, also trying to tell John how to help help him get into his wheelchair safely. Like you had to lift him a certain way, so, right? Right. So um, he didn't get hurt, and so you know John was just like very nervous, like I can't get this wheelchair together, and I'm oh, I'm gonna hurt, I'm gonna break Benjamin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we found him a certain way. We want to leave him a certain way. Uh, rest in peace. Rest in peace, Benjamin. Oh, um, do you remember um, Dan and Judy, the improv teachers? <clears throat> Uh, no, I don't. Oh, um, used to um, open the 94th Aero Squadron with a uh, um, an improv set. Um, they and Tree and I and Don McMillan and Beecher Sykes, we were all in an improv group uh, together. I never did improv, oh, wow. and um, you guys are too smart for me. I couldn't think of anything that quickly. I, I used to love to do that. It was very freeing that you you didn't have to be yourself you could be you know you could be the president of the duck association and if you pretended like you knew what you were doing you'd get away with it right <laughs> right um what was your worst comedy moment oh wow i got booked to um be the uh, intermission act in a rock open uh, a music open mic right People didn't expect a comedian to be the intermission. I went up on stage and I was pretty much, you know, background noise and nobody was paying attention. I started reciting the chemical element chart. And, and, and nobody knew the <laughs> and difference. And nobody knew the difference. I was like, hydrogen, H, helium, H, E, carbon, C, and nobody... You know, I just I did some time right. and left the stage, and that was my worst. Uh, and that was the worst. Now, conversely, what was your best? Ah, uh, my best. Um, 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 I think lately I've been I've been doing my best. Um, I think that. Um, that's the best answer. That just the way you said that. Yeah, I mean, you nodded your head mm -hmm. and you looked inwardly a little bit and you examined it and. Uh, Man, that was a great answer. Yeah, I think I've gotten some maturity over not caring. If, right. <laughs> if I go up there and I care a lot about if I do well or not, then I'm going to be nervous. And But if I just go up there and I'm like, I know this material works and I'm just going to do it the way I do it. And and um, that's been very relaxing. And I, I feel like having this break has helped me. It, it would have been nice to have been consistently working all these years, but, you know... But you, uh, you had priorities. Mm-hmm, yep. And uh, I think what we both agree on, that the major priority, not just for us, but with all of us, is our kids. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to ask you on behalf of Rebecca, be loving to your kids. Mm -hmm. And loving isn't just loving, it's unconditional loving. Love them for what they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I always um, say being a mom is the is a really hard job. Being a new mom is the only job where you have to wait for your boss to fall asleep before you get a bathroom break. <laughs> <laughs> did um, you, know you didn't actually you did? Oh, excuse me. You know what else being a mom is? <laughs> it's the largest pool of uncompensated labor in the world. Yep, yeah. Oh, you know what? I ran into Tom Amiano at the at Safeway a few uh, days ago, and, and I told him he was my hero when one time he suggested um, 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 subsidizing new mothers for a while. I was like, yeah, 
we are worth something. <laughs> um, more than more than you know, more than you know, Rebecca. You really are. Which brings me to Diane. Uh, Diane Satin uh -huh. uh, started just exactly the same time, and we met d doing comedy as well. Um, we made it, as it were, and um, enjoyed both enjoyed a different slant of raising children. Diane is a career person. When I when we were doing comedy, she was getting her PhD in Cal, mm -hmm. at Cal. Um, she wanted a career and she wanted a child too, but she didn't want strangers raising her child. Mm -hmm. So we got together and um, I was the stay at home guy. I wanted a child, but over a lifetime experience, I was 44 at the time and I wasn't going to make for a financial stable kind of guy mm -hmm. that could be responsible for a family and do it right so we gave each other um, what we always wanted and um, it's it's worked out um, after the first five years we went our separate ways Diane and I mm -hmm. raised him um, together but not together mm -hmm. yeah. um, That's I became I became van man and motorhome man I mm -hmm. um, bought motorhomes in van I live live as a tourist and I mm -hmm. use wise and 24-hour fitness centers and uh, go around as a little gypsy but I'm home I'm based right where my kid is and have been all these years um, it's been great f uh, from that standpoint. Diane did something a little bit out of the ordinary that I uh, needs to be commented on. After we split, um, she thought that it would be great for Philip. She couldn't have any more kids at that point, but she thought it might be great for Philip to have a sibling. Mm -hmm. So they went down, this was Diane's thing, and um, brought a little brother, uh, five-year-old at the time, oh. Christopher Foster, ironically, became <laughs> her foster child, and she later adopted Christopher, so Philip has a brother. Oh. And oh. Um, it wasn't my thing, it was hers, as she told me right from the get-go, but soon enough, uh, Christopher and I bonded because he was Chris he was Philip's brother, mm -hmm. and um, so in essence, she gave me two kids, and she's been terrific along those lines. And we've seen eye to eye on very little else mm -hmm. over the years mm -hmm. but the well-being of those kids. Yeah. And we've come to realize um, she's been ill a little bit lately and we've had the, the chance to talk over a whole bunch of stuff mm -hmm. that it was always uh, Phil first and then us. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was okay that way. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I want to reach out once again on the air and say thanks to Diane for all all she's given me. She's the mother of the year every year mm -hmm. and the mother as well. <laughs> so uh, she has the way of being both and I have the way of being both too. We're, uh, we're gray. Folks are just gray. We're not all good. We're not all bad. We're just doing the best we can. Uh, myself, I have a lot of Popeye in me mm -hmm. where... Um, I am's what I am, uh -huh. and that's all's what I am. And I also have a lot of Popeye in me that that's all's I could stands, because I can't stands no more. And today was a perfect, you witnessed that today, <laughs> under some excruciating circumstances. And it doesn't matter, does yeah. it? We yeah. could do, we go on with things, and life goes on. Um, yeah, the current studio right now is about the size of the Holy City Zoo green room. Right. Um, <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, we're using a makeshift studio at the moment. We are on the road with Comfortably Zoned in San Francisco, California. Literally on the road. Uh, it's been great. Uh, I've so much enjoyed your company. I have yeah. two questions to ask you. Will you become a friend of the show? Uh-huh, sure. And mm -hmm. you'll come back? Oh, yeah, definitely. And mm -hmm. you'll just share stuff. It doesn't have to be comedy. You'll, um, you'll be mm -hmm. part part of us and you call in from time to time and, oh, you, yeah. and you, you'll want to come in the, in the studio wherever that studio is yeah, a and b 
Did you have fun? Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. Whoa, it's see, fun I asked, out that's with you. the last question I ask in every interview, mm -hmm. and I've never gotten a no uh, <laughs> from that. And you lit up when you said that, so I know you'll be back. Yeah, definitely. It's fun talking with you. I remember when you were Becky. Yeah, that's what that's uh, when I was living in my friend Judy's house. Uh, her daughter was named Becky, and so we were Dos Beckys. Ah, um, yeah, and then as opposed to Dos Equis. Yeah, and then when I started doing more stand up, I changed it to Rebecca. So uh, we've been uh, at it for 25 years. Oh, so, yeah, a long time. Uh, forgot to listen to the response about Cantu, John Cantu. What do you remember most about John Cantu? And then we'll close it out. Oh, um, just just uh, that he was everywhere doing everything, um, very curmudgeonly sometimes, but um, also very much full of good advice that, that, that a lot of people gained by listening to him. He was a... A good guy. Mm -hmm. Comedy, comedy, comedy. <laughs> so I'll tell you what John Cantor t told me once. I, I, when I went into this, I thought, well, you know, I have a lot of political views. I'll just get up on stage and, you know, everything's so funny. So uh, I do a set once, and I come off very early on in my career, as it were, career. And he says, you know, he says, I like that political stuff. He says, but every now and again, you can feel free to throw in some humor and stuff, too. <laughs> 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 so I said, I'll try to work on that before I pursue my comedy career. And by the next time, I was a little funnier. You get a little funnier, and um, each time you do it, and you're, um, it's all a matter of the fun that you get from it. Mm -hmm. Hey, thanks, Becky. Yes, thanks, Ralph. <laughs> and thank you, Scott, for being here today under adverse circumstances. Thank you both, and thank nice meeting you, Rebecca. Yeah, it's nice to meet you, too. Glad you comfortably zoned, both of you.